What's up guys, I'm Let's Fly RC, and today we are going to build my new frame, the Outlaw. Each country has their own rules about drones, but almost every country has this threshold of 250 grams under which certain rules don't apply to the drone. You can basically get away with a lot more with a lightweight drone. So of course that means you could just fly micro drones, but here at Rotor Riot we like to fly 5 inch freestyle drones. So I wanted to design a frame that was light enough to fly under the radar, but still give you that 5 inch freestyle experience. Now this frame can be set up in multiple different ways using different batteries, different prop configurations, and even carry an action camera in certain configurations and still be under 250 grams. First though, unfortunately, we don't have any extra parts laying around, so we're gonna have to pull this guy apart and put it back together. So your outlaw frame is gonna come with a three millimeter bottom plate, a two millimeter top plate, screws for the stack, and standoffs, and a couple of screws to mount the standoffs. You'll also need four motors, and we have two different KV variants, depending on whether you wanna go with a 4S battery or a 6S battery. We're gonna have the 1700 KV motor for the 6S, or the 3000 KV motor for the 4S. We are using the Seal Racing Toothpick Flight Controller ESC all-in-one combo for this build to save as much weight as possible. You're gonna need an XT30 lead with just the right length of wire. Everything in this build makes a huge difference in weight, down to the props, down to the amount of wire length, and down to the amount of solder you put on. Every single gram counts in this build because I put it as close to 250 grams as possible. Any little thing that you do on this build might put it over 250 grams and you might have to take something off. Down to the amount of tape that you put on the arms to hold the wires down. So. We're gonna go over everything and try to do the best we can to keep it as close to 250 grams as possible. This frame uses the SharkBite Digital HD system so that we can have a nice, beautiful HD video signal on a very, very lightweight frame. One of the greatest things about the SharkBite system is that it's insanely lightweight. So this is actually a SharkBite that I've already mounted an Axie antenna on and put it through the 3D printed mount. You wanna use a little bit of goop right here on the connection, that's why I haven't taken it off because I don't wanna to have to redo that glue. The little goop right here keeps this from popping off when you're flying around and crashing into stuff. The SharkBite system also comes with a run cam camera and I've already mounted up the 3D printed mounts in, a, in that configuration. You're gonna wanna do that as well ahead of time. I have multiple different 3D print mounts for different action cameras as well. I'll have one for the Insta360 Go, one for the Insta360 Go 2, and for the SMO camera from Beta FPV. So depending on which battery configuration you go with, I have three different battery options that I've tried with this system. I've run the 450 milliamp hour 4S battery by Tattoo, and this 450 milliamp battery by Tattoo is perfect for an action camera. It allows you just enough power to have a nice three or four minute flight with an action camera like we would in a regular FPV flight of our typical five inch drones. The 650 works with some configurations that are a little bit too heavy. For example, if you built it just a little bit too heavy, you can use a 650 milliamp hour battery instead of the 850 that I used for the non action camera build and that'll make up a couple of grams if you need it. The SharkBite system comes with a capacitor and you can either use this capacitor or not depending on whether you need to save a gram or two. It's a good idea to use a capacitor. I totally recommend using the capacitor because SharkBite recommends it for voltage spikes and it'll keep you from accidentally damaging your VTX if you get a really hard voltage spike. We're gonna be using the RXSR receiver from FR Sky in this build. You can also use a Spectrum receiver as long as it fits into the same size and weight configuration. In order to use Crossfire, you'll probably have to use their lighter weight antenna on this build because the Immortal T is gonna be a little bit too heavy for this build. On this build, we're gonna be using the 3000 KV variant of the T-Motor 2004 motor, and that's going to give us the right KV for a 4S setup. So there's two different prop configurations I used in this build. There's the Gemfan 5130 tri-blade and the Gemfan 5126 bi-blade prop. The bi-blade props actually weigh about a gram less than the tri-blades, so if you need to save a couple grams, you can sometimes go with a bi-blade. Some people like the flight characteristics of a bi-blade better. Some people like the flight characteristics of a tri-blade better. These things were insanely fast, and if you need to tame it down a little bit, maybe going down to a bi-blade will give you more of that regular five-inch feel. So the tools you need for this build are the 1.5 millimeter hex driver, a pair of wire cutters, some solder, 
soldering iron, maybe some tweezers, a little bit of heat shrink, some zip ties, and a few miscellaneous screws that should come with the kit. All right, to begin this build, we're going to go ahead and install the gummies into this frame. Because it's a unibody frame, I wanted to make sure we didn't get any bad vibrations into the flight controller. So I went ahead and designed it with holes in the frame that are perfectly designed to allow these gummies to go through. And that will help to isolate the flight controller a little bit more from the frame vibrations. Getting these little guys in is a little bit of a challenge, but it's not that bad. All right, just kind of push them through the hole. Be careful not to tear them. And I just kind of use the 1.5 millimeter driver to push it through from the backside, and that helps. Just be careful not to tear it when you're doing it. Be very gentle so you don't tear the gummy on the way through. Okay, so after you have your gummies installed, you can start to install the stack screws. These are M2 stack screws that are metal, and you just kind of slide them through the gummy. Just like that. So the receiver is actually going to be going underneath the flight controller. So we're going to want to put that on next. This little rectangular section right here is where the receiver is going to be mounted. And so this will be the front of the frame and this will be the back of the frame. So we're going to take a little tiny piece of double-sided tape, the smallest piece of double-sided tape that will actually hold it down to save weight. And we're going to mount this RXSR receiver right here so the wires will go underneath the bottom of the flight controller. Just take a little tiny piece of tape. There we go. We'll just stick this guy down right about there. Pull these wires forward here because they're going to go under the bottom of the flight control board. All right, now that we've got our receiver mounted, we can put our flight control board in place. We're going to place it with the USB port facing backwards. It's really, really tight. You're going to have to have a really thin USB port if you're going to try to squeeze that in after the fact. If you're using the XSR receiver, from FR Sky, we're gonna be using these three pads here that are soldered for our power, ground, and signal lead. All right, so this goes channel one, five volt ground. So we'll go ahead and hook our yellow lead over here, and then we're gonna have five volts in the middle and ground over there. So you wanna go ahead and tin the wires and tin the pads, get a nice shiny solder joint when you're done. All right, so I'm just inspecting my solder joints to make sure that nothing's touching. All these electronics are very small, so you want to make sure that you don't have any solder bridges jumping any of these little tiny components together or the thing won't work when you're finished. So now that that's done, I'm just going to go ahead and tuck these wires up under the flight control board so that nothing is sticking out and it's nice and clean. There we go. So the next step in this build is to go ahead and install the motors. Let's go ahead and put one motor on each arm using the provided screws that come with the motors. So the shorter screws that come with the motor should be a five millimeter M2 screw, just in case production changes over time. I'm trying to let you know what these are. And the M6 screw is what you're gonna be using for the prop. When you're screwing these in, make sure that these screws don't come too far through the motor and touch the windings. The front of the motor is more vulnerable than the back of the motor because of these wires that are coming out here. They do pass right over the screw holes and if you're not careful, you can damage these wires here. These screws here should be the perfect length to where I don't have to worry about it. And I can tell in the back here because I don't see the screw popping through the back of the motor here, which means that the screw is not gonna make contact with any of the wires. So what you wanna do is go ahead and just get these screws in kind of loose once you have all four screws in, then you can torque them down, but don't go too crazy. When the screws are loose, the motor's able to be moved around a little bit and it'll keep you from accidentally cross-threading these screws. Since they're so small, it's really easy to cross-thread them and it's really easy to over-tighten them. Just go ahead and tighten them down snug and repeat that process for the other three motors. All right, so the next step in this process is we want to go ahead and cut these motor wires to length. These motors on this particular build are already cut to length because I just took it apart, but when you're building this, you're gonna need to cut these motor wires yourself. And I'm probably gonna trim a little bit of fat off of this build as well in the process because these are just a little bit too long and I can trim a little bit of fat off of there, a little bit of weight. Before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and put some electrical tape on the wires to keep them from moving around and keep everything clean. You can either go crazy on the electrical tape like I did in our episode so that we didn't end up chopping the wires up with the props, or you can be very, very minimalist and save as much weight as possible like I'm gonna do here. So I'm actually laying the tape out on the table and I'm gonna end up slicing the tape into smaller pieces so that I can conserve as much weight as possible. I'm gonna cut six total strips so that I have two left over for the antenna right here on the receiver. We're gonna put two extra pieces of tape right here and here for the antenna. We're gonna wait until later to do that. All right, so the next thing you wanna do is just line your motor wires up leaving a tiny bit of slack on each one. These right here, these ones right here are pretty much the perfect length. Some of the other ones that I cut are just a little bit long and I'm gonna trim a little bit of fat off of those guys as I'm putting it back together here. You wanna cut your wires to length. This wire is gonna be about 
four millimeters longer than this wire. This wire is going to be about four millimeters longer than that wire. Once you get your wires cut and trimmed, we'll go ahead and tin them up and solder them onto the flight control board. ESC combo, everything board. Just going to kind of push these wires down in place, make it look clean, and we'll move on to the next ones. So repeat this process for the other three motors, trimming off as much fat as possible but make sure you leave a little bit of slack just in case you have to go back and do some repairs in the future. Make sure to clean your solder tip as often as possible. It keeps your solder looking pretty and shiny and fresh. If you have any problems like this where the solder pops up and creaks a little, creates a little peak, just go ahead and desolder it and retin both surfaces with fresh solder and you'll get a much better result. Look at that, that's beautiful. Now this particular flight control board ended up in the water in our episode of the outlaw. So if there's anything that looks a little bit out of place here, it's probably not CL Racing's fault. So keep that in mind. I'm not sure if that's glue holding that capacitor down right there or if that's corrosion from being in the water. Pretty much everything was still working after this thing dried out. So that's a pretty good testimony to this setup. I'm not going to push these motor wires over into this corner yet because I still need to solder up my power and ground over here. So we're just going to kind of leave these guys set aside like that in the meantime. So at this stage now, I think we're ready to go ahead and wire up our power and ground wires. Now I've cut these to about an inch and a half length. I've got my positive lead just a little bit longer, about four millimeters longer than my negative lead. So that way when I do mount it up and I wrap it through the strap, it ends up being in the right orientation. Whenever you solder these onto the XT30 connector, Round means ground. That's a little rhyme that I remember to help me remember which one goes on which side. So the square lead is where your positive wire goes and the round side is where your negative lead goes. You should probably use some heat shrink too, but to save weight, you know, I didn't do it. It's, it's fine. You gotta look really closely because it's really small and hard to see. Tiny negative right there that's almost microscopic. You gotta have these really cool glasses to see it. But that's where the negative goes on the right and the positive goes on my left. So we're going to go ahead and put our positive and negative leads on the board here in this orientation here. Since this is going to have multiple connections, I'm going to go ahead and put just a little bit more solder on the top to create like a ball. That's going to help me to put the capacitor and any other parts that might need to have positive and negative connected to them. I think I'm going to have three positives and three negatives on this particular board. So it's going to create a little bit of extra solder on the top. So it'll give me something to attach to later. So now that I've got the power leads in place, I'm gonna go ahead and slide these remaining motor wires over so that everything looks clean and tight and tidy and pretty and beautiful. All right, so this capacitor just barely fits in the frame. So if you're gonna put this on, you have to be mindful of the fact that it could hit the prop if you're not careful how you're installing the capacitor. And like I said, this is a step that I recommend. I've only had a problem with these VTXs shorting out on much bigger builds, uh, like full size five inch quads. But because I've had a couple of them go bad because we didn't put this capacitor on, I'm gonna go ahead and put the capacitor on this build just in case so that way I'm being ultra protective of it. So I'm gonna slide this capacitor up under the wires so that they're very, very close to their mounting point because I need this to be as close to the arm as possible. The white stripe over here is the negative side of the capacitor. You need to make sure that's on the right side when you're putting it on. So now I'm going to use my tools here to get everything in place and just solder that guy on and then I'll work on the positive section in a minute. All right, now I'm gonna bend this capacitor over just a little bit without breaking it, get that positively where I want it to be. Be mindful of the gummy so that you don't end up restricting your ability to put another gummy on top of that gummy because we're going to end up putting another gummy on top of that one and make sure you're not bridging anything else together at the same time. There we go. That was fun. All right, so now I'm going to double check all my connections and make sure that everything is tight and clean and nothing is bridging out and I'm going to push this capacitor down as far as I can get it to go without breaking off the wires. These wires are fragile so you got to be a little bit careful with them and I just kind of route the power lead this direction and I might even put a zip tie or a piece of tape on this to hold it down in place once the build is complete so that way it doesn't end up coming up and getting hit by the prop. So the next step we're going to go ahead and put some zip ties on the arms to allow us to get these wires from the receiver mounted in place so that they don't get chopped up by the props. I'm going to go ahead and put them up through this hole here. Actually I'm going to go down through the hole because I want the zip tie to exit on the bottom. and. We're gonna go ahead and also secure the wires in place at the same time while we're doing this. If you put the zip tie on in this orientation and you cinch it down 
just right, it'll actually come out underneath the frame rather than on top of the frame. Kind of point it down a little bit towards the ground. It'll help to keep it out of the props. And then we're gonna run this wire up under these other wires and we're gonna heat shrink it to that zip tie. You can use the other zip tie to push it under if you need to and that'll help you get it underneath the wires. This is actually a method that I've seen Joshua Barwell do many, many times and I've been doing it for a long time as well. And it's been my favorite method of keeping the receiver wires from getting chopped up by the props. So we'll just go ahead and put that there, cut the zip tie to the right length, just a little bit longer than your receiver wire and slide a piece of heat shrink over and heat shrink it down. And repeat that process on the other side. All right, and so with our last two pieces of tape here, we're gonna go ahead and wrap them around the receiver wires here just to keep those out of the way and keep them out of the props. Careful not to go over your holes there or you won't have any way to mount your standoffs in the future. Okay, so the next step, we're gonna go ahead and wire up the VTX or the SharkBite digital FPV system. Then the SharkBite digital FPV system has four wires that need to be connected. So we're going to need a ground, power, TX, and RX. Okay, so we're gonna use these four pads for our wires on our flight controller. We're gonna have ground, TX6, RX6, and positive. We're gonna connect to those four points with our four wires, and then we'll connect them up to the SharkBite system afterwards. So I wanna go ahead and solder these up with the wires facing inward, and the hardest one to reach is gonna be the TX pad, so we're gonna go ahead and wire up the green wire to the TX pad first. So get you some nice short pieces of wire here, about that length, and we'll go ahead and tin it up and attach it to the flight control board. We're gonna go ahead and put our blue onto the RX pad. There we go. And our ground on the ground pad. Positive is a little bit more tricky because you have to try to get it on top of that ball that we created earlier. There we go. Now we got our four wires on the flight control board. We're gonna go ahead and solder them onto the VTX. We're gonna tin these four pads right here. We've got ground, voltage, RX, and TX. We're gonna put this in order from black, red, green, and blue because black's our ground, red's our voltage, green is our RX, and blue is our TX. Now this one's real fun because it's right next to that connector. Be careful on this last one so you don't melt that connector. Not that we're using it for anything, but it doesn't always smell so good. There we go. This is gonna be positioned on the frame with the camera connector facing forward and the antenna facing backwards. But before we put this down, we're gonna to need to put some gummies in between to space it up from the flight control board. We're also gonna to wanna to put our camera cable on and our antenna wire, because if you put the camera cable on here, you can actually slide a zip tie up through the frame here and grab onto the camera cable so that it never comes disconnected from the VTX. So if you put this on there and squeeze it down with your thumb, just kind of get it lined up as best as you can. These connectors are very, very sensitive, but you get it. You can get it lined up just right and you'll hear it click in place when you have it right. Just don't push down too hard and break the connections. You'll feel it if you get it right. And then once you have that in place, you can put a little tiny zip tie up through these holes if you want to lock it down in place. I'm not gonna put them on this particular build just to save some weight, but if you wanted to, you can run a zip tie right up through that hole there, bring it down here and cinch it in place. and It'll keep this from moving out of place. We didn't have this camera connector come off, so I'm not too worried about it. But in some situations, you might do a little more crashing it might be a good idea to go ahead and have that zip tie in place. For now, I'm gonna go ahead and put the spacer gummies in between the flight controller and the VTX. There we go. So one set of gummies should be perfect to keep all the parts from touching the flight control board because what you wanna what you want to try to avoid is having anything touching from the VTX to the flight control board that might cause any vibrations. One set of gummies is the perfect distance to give me about two millimeters between the plastic connector back here and the USB port. All right, so the next step, I'm gonna go ahead and put these four nylon nuts in place to hold our VTX and keep it from moving around. And then after that, we'll go ahead and put our standoffs on. Go ahead and use my 1.5 millimeter hex to go ahead and tighten these down. Don't go too crazy, they don't need to be super tight, but just tight enough to where they're not gonna come loose. If you tighten them too tight, you'll be pulling the two boards too close together and then they'll end up touching like we're trying to avoid. Just about like that. Now we're gonna go ahead and put our four standoffs in place with the four screws provided with the frame. 
We've got four holes in the frame to mount our standoffs. One, two, three, four. All right, now once we have our rear standoffs in place, we should be able to just slide our antenna 3D print right over top of the back standoffs and they're locked in place. Make sure to secure your UFL connector with a little bit of shoe goo or I don't know if I'd recommend hot glue. Hot glue might damage the electronics on the board, but shoe goo works really good for this. It locks it in place. Some people use liquid electrical tape if you can't find shoe goo, but I prefer the shoe goo just because it's a little bit more solid when it's dry. Keeps that connector from popping off when you're flying around because you don't want to damage your VTX by not having an antenna connected to it. All right, and since we're on this step, we might as well go ahead and put our camera in place. Now your 3D prints are not going to be molded into this shape yet. They're just going to be flat pieces of TPU. You're going to have to kind of pinch them and bend them into this shape. And then once you have them bent like that, and your camera at an appropriate angle, you can just slide them over top of the standoffs just like this. Slide the camera down, and it'll just kind of pop into place. But before you push it too far down, make sure you have your camera connector onto the back of the camera, just like this, and snap it in place. Now I also recommend putting some of this shoe goo on the back of the camera as well because the one major problem that we've had with these is that these camera cables do come off really easily. So if you put a little bit more of that shoe goo on top of the camera, uh, you'll keep that camera cable from popping off in crashes. And just slide it down like that and it fits beautifully like a glove. So the SMO camera comes with this cable and if you want to be able to start and stop recording with a switch on your transmitter, you can actually wire this up to power, ground, and a UART connector with this yellow lead and then whenever you flip a switch on your transmitter it'll actually start recording by the flip of a switch. It's really cool. I soldered this up to one of the pads and the flight controller there. We're not going to use it in this build just because we're trying to give you a quick rundown on how to do the build. Uh, but if you want to go ahead and wire that up you can hook up positive and negative. This yellow wire is going to go on the board right here. And this white connector right here will just plug right into the side of the camera and give you power for the camera and the ability to control the start and stop of the recording. If when you're done with this build, you're just a couple grams off and you want to run an action camera, the Insta360 GO is just a few grams lighter than the SMO camera. Maybe you can make up a couple grams there by using a different action camera. So the last part of this build is to put on the top plate. And this top plate is different than what the final revision is going to be. The final top plate should have two holes in the top right here. And that's going to allow you to put a zip tie through the top plate to mount on the 3D printed mounts that I have created for different action camera setups. I will have a 3D printed mount for the SMO camera. I'll also have one for the Insta360 GO. The old and new Insta360 GO will have both Insta360 mounts available in the Rotorite store if you want to pick those up. We'll put these four screws in the top plate. And I'm just putting these screws in loosely. I'll tighten them when I'm done. It helps me to line everything up properly. Sometimes when you torque one down, it doesn't want to line up to the rest of them. I'll put a final torque on all four of these. Don't go crazy. You don't have to make it too tight. And the last little bit is to put on a little tiny battery pad and a battery strap. And like I said before, down to the battery strap, every gram matters in this build. Put a little tiny piece of battery pad down to hold our battery, keep it from sliding around and our very lightweight battery strap. We gotta install our props and this build's ready to go. So you can choose from two different kinds of props as I was saying before. You can use either the bi-blade props or the tri-blade props depending on what your desires are for this machine and whether you want it to go crazy or whether you want it to fly a long range. You can do a lot of different things with this quad and have a great time. And so these four props weigh approximately 13 grams altogether as a whole. And the bi-blade props only weigh 10 grams. So you can save yourself an extra two grams if you need them just by running bi-blades over tri-blades. So these props have adapters. You have to put these adapters in first if you're gonna use the M2 screws to mount them. And they're kind of a pain in the butt to deal with. Each motor needs two screws per prop. These are six millimeter M2s. I just kind of put the screw in there and turn the motor around until I find the hole and it makes it easy. We're gonna go ahead and put the battery on so we can get the weight. All right, so with no action camera and a medium sized battery, we are at 227. We have plenty of grams to spare with a medium sized battery. With a larger battery, it'll be right at 250 grams, maybe a couple grams over or a couple grams under, depending on how you build it. I've built them a bunch of different times and sometimes I'm one or two grams over, sometimes I'm one or two grams under. Like I said, it's, depending on how, how you build it and how stringent you are with wire lengths and the amount of solder you're using, 
the heaviness of your battery strap, all those things come into play when you're talking about how much weight this thing is. Uh, but anyway, with a 650 milliamp hour 4S, you should get a six minute flight time on this quad. With an 850 milliamp battery, we were getting seven and eight minute flight times. And with a 450 milliamp hour battery with a action camera attached, we were still getting three to four minute flight times out of this quad. So it's really good, really efficient, and you can have a lot of fun with it. I hope you guys really enjoy this build. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.